From challenging gender norms to challenging herself and those around her to commit to learning and growth, Natalie Panic has been a strong advocate for women in STEM while helping make important advances in her field. She's an aerospace engineer who builds space robots as a member of technical staff at MDA's Robotics and Automation Division. Natalie's worked on a range of product projects that include repairing and servicing satellites and working on the Mars space rover. She's also worked on partnerships with Barbie for the launch of Astronaut Barbie and a documentary about her experiences, Space to Explore, premiered at the Banff Film Festival. Throughout her challenging projects, she understands that learning and growth happens every day from failure, from colleagues, and from new experiences. And you'll find she's also really accessible, down to earth, and, uh, and provides hope for our future. Today, Natalie shares her experiences and lessons learned as a woman in STEM and her advice for structuring your life to build in learning opportunities, remain open to possibilities, and hold yourself accountable for growing. Welcome, Natalie. Hello, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Teresa, and hello to everyone online. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I'm going to share my screen now and just kind of walk you through in the time we have here together some of my really cool experiences I've had and lessons learned and uh, starting from how it all began for me. So I am based in Toronto now, and I actually grew up in Calgary and the Rockies. And every weekend from May long to September long, I went camping with my parents and my two brothers. And we spent Saturday and Sunday just outside exploring, whether it was hiking or fly fishing or flying kites, just being curious and having wonder for the world around us. And that interest in the outdoors and that curiosity and passion for adventure has stuck with me Ever since, I'm still constantly trying to get outside and balancing my work and extracurricular activities by spending time in nature and using those spaces to really re-energize and rejuvenate myself. But what I loved most about those weekends outside as a kid and what I still love most about exploring outside today is when the sun sets and it gets dark outside and you can gaze upward and look at the sky and just see so many stars out there and dream of possibilities maybe see the International Space Station go by, or today the Starlink satellites, or even catch a shooting star. And it was in those many, many nights camping as a kid, while also watching a lot of science fiction with my mom, that I decided I didn't want to be just exploring here on Earth. I also wanted to be exploring space. I, I wanted to travel to other planets and go to remote locations that no one had visited before with a really dynamic team um, and, and see those exciting places and so I decided I wanted to be the captain of my own starship like the USS Enterprise and so I set forth on this journey of figuring out how I could one day travel to space and in trying to figure out the next steps of how to get there I realized that I probably wasn't going to be going to Starfleet Academy anytime soon but maybe just maybe I could become an astronaut and work for the Canadian Space Agency for example and so the, the interesting thing about wanting to become an astronaut is there is no one single path. There is no guidebook that says follow these exact steps and you will get there. It is a long shot goal. There are so many different paths you can take and it's really just about having experiences that will possibly set you up to have success if the time ever comes to apply to be an astronaut. And so I started my journey going through mechanical engineering at the University of Calgary and onto a master's degree in aerospace engineering and ultimately ended up where I am now at a company called MDA and where I've been for the last 11 or so years building space robots. So that's anything from robotic arms like the Canada arms to parts of Mars rovers to uh, instruments that are onboard spacecraft helping us explore space. And so this journey that I've had towards trying to become an astronaut has required, I'm going to talk about four things today. It's required confidence, conviction, courage, and compassion. And I'll briefly touch on those in the time we have here today. So as I mentioned, we are a company that builds robotic arms. Our claim to fame is the original Canada arm that flew on the space shuttle and Canada Arm 2 that flew on the space station and is currently onboard space station capturing cargo capsules like the uh, Dragon module. And so when I first started at MDA, one of the really cool projects that they had underway was trying to use robotic arms to uh, repair and 
uh, recycle satellites that are in orbit. So space junk is an issue that's facing us today, where we have all this man-made junk that's orbiting around the Earth that could be the size of small paint flecks to the size of screwdrivers to entire satellites that are no longer working. And satellites are these amazing pieces of technology that power our everyday lives, either directly or indirectly, whether it's GPS or search and rescue or agricultural monitoring or weather and climate monitoring. Monitoring, it's all this amazing technology that is making our lives possible and convenient day to day. But those satellites are a lot like our appliances or our vehicles and that they aren't built to last forever and they can break down. Whereas here on Earth, if my car breaks down or my appliance breaks, I can try and have it repaired or fixed so that I can use it again. Or if my car runs out of fuel, I can just pop into a gas station and put more fuel into it. That type of infrastructure doesn't exist in space. So it's not like you can just call a space tow truck or an orbital mechanic to go over and repair that satellite that is broken down. So we're trying to use this robotic arm technology to go and repair a satellite. So you can pretend the silver one on the bottom of the screen is the tow truck, this gold one on the top is broken down and we're gonna deploy some robotic arms to go and fix it. And so we had this program in Brampton, just outside of Toronto, where we were building all of these prototypes on the ground to prove out this idea of satellite servicing. And when I first started at MDA, I had absolutely zero robotics experience. I hadn't studied it in school, whether it was undergrad or graduate studies. I hadn't had any jobs prior to it where I understood anything about robotics. And so I immediately felt like a fish out of water. I felt so outside of my comfort zone and like I didn't have the skills to contribute to that program and it really eroded away at my confidence for the first few months that I was on that job and in order to overcome that that initial fear that initial vulnerability that everyone often feels in situations outside of their comfort zone I constantly had to remind myself that I was there to learn that I was in this amazing situation where I was surrounded by experts in this field that could teach me things I didn't know and that is such a powerful situation to be in where you can be learning something new every single day and so we often talk about uh, the barriers that women and minorities face in science and tech and engineering careers. And that is an entire other talk unto itself. But one of the barriers I have personally faced is that lack of confidence. And even after 11 years on this job, going into a new project, I still sometimes face that, that erosion away of that confidence, feeling like I don't have the skills to contribute. And for me, the trick is, again, constantly reminding self, myself that learning has no boundaries, that you go outside of your comfort zone to push your limits and test your capabilities and learn something new every single day. The really cool thing about the space projects that we get to work on at MDA is that they are usually one of a kind. They are usually projects that have never been done before. We're trying to push the limits and try out something new that nobody in the world has done, like on-orbit satellite servicing, or like this project I'll talk about for the next few slides, which was part, building part of a Mars rover. So I'm sure everyone on the call today has heard of Mars rovers exploring Mars before, whether it's Spirit or Opportunity or Curiosity, but all of those rovers were built by uh, NASA in the United States. There actually hasn't been a successful rover on Mars built by another country. So for the last five years or so, I had been working on a Mars rover project for the European Space Agency. So it was a number of countries in Europe coming together, including our contribution from Canada, trying to launch this rover called the ExoMars rover, which will launch to Mars in 2022. And our contribution was this whole bottom part of the rover that's called its chassis and locomotion system. So basically the base frame of the rover, its wheels, its legs, and all its motors that it needs to deploy once it gets to Mars to drive around on the surface and then also steer to its target science sites. And this is the actual rover. You are looking at the rover that will launch to Mars in 2020. And so when we're work working on a project like this, when we're working on projects that are really hard where you're building hardware for extreme environments that has to um, survive vacuum, it has to survive radiation exposure, it really extreme temperatures on the surface of Mars, it has to be able to drive through soil and, and tolerate ingress of dust to all the mechanisms and subsystems. It's really, really hard and things often go wrong and 
you can you can design for your requirements and and think you have everything in place. And as soon as you get into test, you will start to see the failures build up and you'll encounter obstacles and roadblocks. And this is where conviction is such a really important part of these types of projects, especially in the aerospace industry, but it really applies to any project. And when I say conviction, I mean belief in the vision of what you are trying to accomplish. Having that optimism and that, that ability to rally back towards your vision and that central focus point of what you're trying to accomplish. I have found in my journey through these engineering projects that oftentimes it's so easy to get bogged down in the technical details and focused on what went wrong and trying to solve that problem that we forget about that big picture, about what we're trying to accomplish, about what the ultimate goal is. And so having people on your team and to remind all of your colleagues and your team members to have that conviction and, and reminder of what the vision is and what you're trying to accomplish is is such a big deal. It gives you just that little bit of extra momentum you need to get to that next step to keep you going and moving forward. And so on this program here, when we encountered obstacles, which we did a lot of them over the five, six year journey of this program, our, our moments of conviction were reminding ourselves we're going to Mars. Just that simple statement, telling ourselves we're going to Mars, because not many people can say they've had the opportunity to build a Mars rover and work on technology that's actually physically going to another planet. And that's just really, really super cool. So quick highlights about a couple of the programs that I'm working on. That was the wheel of the rover, and here they're doing some testing on it at uh, a facility in the, in the UK. And I'll transition quickly now back to my story and my journey about wanting to become an astronaut because that's kind of a piece that people are always curious about. And this is where I wanna talk about courage and courage with respect to setting big goals and dreams, but also courage when faced with failure and re rejection. So a bit of context for the Canadian astronaut program. Um, the Canadian space industry is quite small. Uh, we've only had, a um, a couple handfuls of astronauts since the start of the astronaut program and we only have four active astronauts right now with recruitments for new astronauts often few and far between and so in that period between when they might be looking for astronauts as i was going through my studies and my uh, early parts of my career i was constantly online googling like what do i need to do to become an astronaut what are the types of skills astronauts have what else can be learning what other experiences can i be having to put myself in the best possible position. And then back in 2016, in the fall of 2016, uh, the Canadian Space Agency and the Canadian government announced that they were hiring two new astronauts. And after almost 20 years of working towards this goal, I knew that this was my time. I was ready to apply. And I filled out my application form, which was this huge online section where you had to fill out all kinds of questions about your experiences and your expertise and justifying why you are an expert in certain areas and all of that for two positions where almost 4,000 people applied for just those two positions. So it's, it's pretty slim chances. As I said early on in the presentations, um, wanting to become an astronaut is a pretty long shot goal. And so went through the recruitment process passed in my initial application, went through a number of steps, and then ultimately found out in early 2017 that I had made it into the top 100 of the program. And the top 100 applicants uh, next go on to a really detailed medical, um, depending on where you are in the country. Here, because I was in Toronto, I did my medical at the Downsview Airport. And so you spend a day with the military doctors, go through a series of tests, as well as uh, fill out a very detailed questionnaire about your entire, entire medical history. And then you sit down with the doctor at the very end of the day and go through that medical history. And at the end of all my testing, the very last question on the questionnaire was whether I had a skin disorder or not. And you can see in this picture that I'm showing, I have this really awesome streak of white hair. You might even be able to see it in the video here. And that white hair is caused by a skin disorder that I've had since I was a kid. It is called vitiligo. And so when the doctor asked me this question, I thought nothing of it. I just answered like I do for most people who think it's super cool that I have this streak of white hair and said, yeah, I've got a skin disorder. I've had it forever and it doesn't affect me. Um, and then left my medical interview feeling really, really, really good about it. 
about a month later, I got an email notification from the Canadian Space Agency saying that I had been rejected from the recruitment campaign because of that skin disorder. And I was absolutely heartbroken and devastated that I had worked so hard for something only for it to be taken from my grasp for something so entirely out of my control and for something that absolutely didn't affect me at all or whatsoever. And I spent a lot of time trying to come to terms with that for the many months after I found out I had been rejected and thinking about failure and success because that felt like the biggest failure I had ever encountered. I, it, it was such a letdown to have, as I mentioned, worked so hard for something. And so I, I liked this slide, which you've, I'm sure, seen variations from many, many times over where this blue arrow is like the typical success straight line that people often imagine. And this black one was my scribble all over the page about how my story has gone, gone where often I'm going forwards and sideways and backwards and like swirling down the toilet bowl, just not knowing where to go next. And that rejection from the astronaut recruitment taught me three things about courage. And the first is that it is entirely okay to set big goals and big dreams and not get there at all. There is no shame in failure. There is no shame in not achieving those, those goals because it's all about what you learn along the way and the experiences that you have along the way. The second thing I learned is that success often has um, very little to do with you as a person or rejection rather has very little to do with you as a person and often has more to do with luck and circumstance. And so sometimes it's hard to separate those two things that it, it's not about you and it's just about timing. And then the third thing that I've learned through this uh, rejection phase and the astronaut um, recruitment is that success is not always vertical. It's often sometimes lateral and it's very important to support uh, what success looks like for different people, because success doesn't look the same for everybody. And through that, this process and through my journey as an aerospace engineer at MDA, I have very much learned that I have had success in many lateral areas, and that has made my life extremely fulfilling. It's not for me about necessarily moving upwards all the time, but being able to do outreach and have adventures and do very well in my career at the same time and about balancing all of those things. So I talked about um, confidence, conviction, courage, and I want to quickly end today with a story about compassion. And so on my journey through becoming towards becoming an astronaut, I had an opportunity to attend a program called the Space Studies Program through the International Space Studies University at NASA's Ames Research Center, where I met one of my best friends who is also an engineer. She works at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we have since gone on a trip together almost every year since that program, which was about a decade ago. And our first year out of the program, we decided to do a trip to Peru to hike the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. And we had picked our timing to coincide with her going off to grad school in California, me starting my job at MDA, and also when we thought the best weather would be, so we'd have dry conditions for the hike. And when we started the hike, it started torrentially raining, like raining so hard in a way that you think it's going to rain itself out in the next hour, except it kept raining throughout that entire day we started our hike and the entire next day, and the entire third day, and the entire fourth day. Just absolute downpours. We couldn't see anything. The beautiful mountain passes that we thought we were gonna get, these gorgeous vistas we were going to see was completely socked in and completely fogged in. And it was the type of weather that like could really make or break you, where it just wears you down because it's constantly raining and you're constantly wet. And we had gone over summits in blizzards and were just freezing cold the entire time. And, it, it, you know, it kind of puts a damper on that entire experience. On our last night of the journey, which is the night before you head to the sun gate to get to Machu Picchu, the skies actually started to clear. And when we woke up the next morning, it was an absolutely beautiful day. It was blue skies. It was sunny out it was just incredible and we were hiking up to the sun gate and my friend who I was traveling with was starting to feel not very well it could have been a combination of the weather or something she had eaten or just feeling worn out and so 
I was moving at a faster pace than her and she told me to move on, to keep going and that she would meet me at the top. And that's what I did. I just went ahead and went to the top of the sun gate and got there by myself and took it in by myself. And I had this gut wrenching feeling in my stomach that I had just left somebody behind, that I had left my travel companion to get to the top first, to show that I was the fastest and, and show that I didn't, I wasn't held back by anything. And that, that really stuck with me for a long time after that trip on our journey back to Cusco, on our flight back to Toronto, just thinking about how I had so narrowly focused on my own goals and wanting to get to the top and be at the top first that I was willing to leave someone behind in order to do that. And I didn't want that to be representative of my journey towards becoming an astronaut. I didn't want to be so narrowly focused on wanting to travel to space that I would do anything to get there and leaving other people behind. Because ultimately having one another's back is such a positive and gratifying experience. And there are ways that you can be ambitious and set big goals and still make time to give back to others and help other people along the way, which I think is a large part in why I started doing so much outreach and trying to put my story out there and share my story so that I could make it easier for others who followed me, make it easier for others to follow a similar path, to not have faced the same barriers that I faced on this journey. And so, yeah, compassion is just such a huge part of of everything I do now and, and trying to recognize in spaces that I go on where people aren't being heard or don't have a platform to speak up or aren't being fairly and I'll end today sharing something that I heard, and I can't even give the credit to this person because I can't remember who said it, but it has stuck with me ever since. And they said, anytime you go into a room, whatever space it is, a meeting, playing a sport, um, going to an event, take a look around the room. And if everybody in that space looks like you, then something needs to change. And if you have taken the time, that instant to acknowledge who is in that room, then you then have the power to make a change and start bringing in more diversity and more perspectives and more opinions and and just yeah because that's better for the bottom line bringing all those people and perspectives in and making sure that we are compassionate and kind and again having one another's back along our journeys and supporting each other's visions of success as we go so again thank you so much for coming today and hearing just a little glimpse into my story and uh how much fun i've had along the way Thank you, Natalie, uh, for that walk through um, some of your incredible experiences and uh, and that ending piece on compassion. I could uh, I could feel it through the screen. Um, so appreciate um, kind of the fully rounded approach that you've taken uh, to sharing some of this uh, with our with our audience. And I'm happy to share some of the questions that are coming through and appreciate you uh, sharing a bit more of your time to um, to answer those. We have a question about um, your experience as a woman in a male dominated industry and anything you could share for others who may be in a similar type of industry. Yeah, that's a good question. I get that um, all the time. Fortunately for me, I've had a lot of great experiences. I, I've had so many great colleagues and mentors who have really rallied for me and, and helped me get to those next steps and lifted myself up. Um, one of the things I will say about, about women in male dominated industries is that we often um, we look at just pieces of the pipeline. So often we'll see stats saying like coming out of university, they have like the highest ever record of women graduating from undergrad engineering and, and that kind of thing. And I, that that's really exciting. And it's great that the numbers are changing, but we also need to look at what happens as those women move through their careers and up into industry as in like are they moving into industry once they're in industry are they staying for five ten years or are they dropping out and moving to a different industry are they being promoted in their fields are they moving into director level and board level and management positions so we really need to look at at changing the ratio with a really wide lens and making sure we're addressing all stages of that pipeline thank you for that <clears throat> we have a question from uh, Mark and Roger, I think, uh, about the learning curve. 
So what's the learning curve like when you're trying to apply the physics of landing operating equipment on another planet uh, versus on Earth? Um, I, the learning curve is steep, but it, it's, it's exciting because you're always working with a team. So you always have people to bounce ideas off of and you're brainstorming and working on things together and, and overcoming those challenges of trying to figure out how it all works on a different planet together. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's hard for some of us to even fathom how to figure out how something might uh, might actually work on a whole different planet. <laughs> we have a question from Lisa wondering, would you reapply for the astronaut program if you had the opportunity or if any of the criteria changed? Would you, could you? Um, I don't know, actually. I don't know. I think, I yeah, I think I'd have to reevaluate if that ever happened. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, you've shared, especially in your uh, last piece about um, how much you love being outdoors. And many of us are isolating and not feeling um, either the opportunity to go outdoors or the motivation to do so. Can you share a little bit about uh, the power of that in your life and how it might help others? Yeah, I mean, I can totally relate. Um, it's been very challenging to get outside, but um, I personally at least try and go for a walk every day. That's something and just just that that nature and the quiet and and even the cold because it's winter now, I find re-energizing and just gives me space and separation from my job and being able to put that aside for a little bit of time to kind of clear my head. And that ultimately leaves me at least feeling a little bit more recharged to get back to it the next day. Great, thank you. Yes, I've got to incorporate that even more. I live close to a park, I should be doing it more often. Um, and that ties into one of the questions we have from Laura, who's asking about three habits that got you to where you are today. Oh, that's a great question. Um, maybe not habits, but traits. I will say um, optimism. That's like a huge one. I've always been an optimistic person and trying to find silver linings and small joys and things. Um, I would also say <laughs> perseverance. I didn't talk about it a lot today, but I know like Teresa and others at NSB have heard me talk about how many times I've just gone after things over and over again, even though I've been rejected and yeah, just continuing to pursue things. And then I would say the third is like communication. That's such a huge part of my job and just trying to break things down into digestible pieces that are easy, but also a lot of storytelling. And, and that's important, whether I'm interacting with my colleagues or doing outreach or speaking or interacting with the customers that I work with. Thank you. And we have a question from Michelle that I think picks up on your speaking about confidence. Do you ever find yourself suffering from imposter syndrome and how do you overcome it? Yeah, so I think that imposter syndrome was kind of basically what I was talking about in my first story about working at MDA. And I still feel that now, like I'll start a new program thinking, oh, these people aren't gonna think I'm the right person for this job or that I have the skills. And that's where I was saying, I'm just constantly trying to remind myself that I'm there to learn. I'm there to learn. And if I'm learning something, then that's, that's the best position to be in. Thank you. And um, Jennifer, who's a student, wonders, what motivates you to do what you do? What motivates me to do what I do? I, I just love the idea of working things that are working on things that are going to space. I just, I find it so exciting. Fantastic. And so finding something that really kind of sparks your passion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Dolly is asking about um, referencing how you reframed your experience of not being able to become an astronaut and wonders with our experiences during the pandemic, do you have any advice about how to apply that kind of resilience now? Oh, great question, Dolly. I, quickly, I would say just constantly reframing problems as opportunities. Um, it, it's easy to see something as a roadblock or an obstacle, but trying to switch that perspective to see how that might be an opportunity for growth or to give back. Thank you. 
And uh, we started this off talking a bit about um, International Women's Day and the importance of women in STEM. And uh, we have a last question about what do you think is the number one change that STEM programs need to make to encourage more women to apply? Hmm, that's a loaded question. So I think there are already lots of women who want to apply to programs, they are out there and it's about creating safe spaces where women can go and feel like they, um, there isn't going to be unconscious bias or roadblocks in the form of not getting promotions or not getting treated equally there there's yeah that's such a huge question to answer because there isn't one thing it's like I always say it's death by a thousand cuts right it's all these little things that slowly add up over time that erode away the passion and the interest and so we need to start addressing all of the little things that that people don't even recognize and making sure that men are included in those conversations and are willing to be allies Thank you. And that um, brings to mind what you were talking about in terms of the story of, you know, going into a room and everyone looks like you, what can you do to change that? So no matter who we are, um, if we can open up more opportunities all around, it's going to uh, lift everyone up. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this session with us, uh, Natalie, talking us through um, your, uh, your focus on seeing how you can learn beyond any boundaries that uh, you may think are there and uh, focusing on lifelong learning and your four C's. I wanna make sure we've captured them. Confidence, courage, conviction, and compassion. Uh, thank you again for everyone joining us today. We will provide a recording uh, post event that will be available for a limited time. So you have a chance to revisit it or share it with others on your team. And uh, please know that uh, we are always here to help you with great speakers, trainers and entertainers to help with your event programming so that you can kick off the year strong and uh, stay well. Thanks again. We will keep the chat open for a few minutes for any last thoughts and hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks all.